Hello guys and welcome to The Sportsman and today I'm delighted to be joined by QPR manager Michael Beale. Michael, how are you getting on? Really good, thanks Simon. It's a pleasure to come on and talk, mate. Thank you very much. We're just going to have a quick discussion about your career so far and then get into the juicy gossip at QPR and what's going on there this summer. So let's start at the very start of your career at Bromley Church Hall teaching futsal. Did you have a long-term dream at that point? What was your mindset back then? Yeah, I did. I had a long-term dream to be a manager or a head coach. So obviously I fulfilled that coming into this role, but I had sort of an anchor in that, which was to be a youth team coach at a good club. Um, Because I always felt being an under-18s coach was a wonderful uh, job to have. I've probably done every job in football other than under-18s job, to be fair. I skipped it. I was Liverpool's... um, under 23s coach at 33. So that was, uh, I got there probably a little bit too early and then you reassess and you keep going. I think I'm a lot different now in terms of not having so many aims, but just more wanting to work in in an environment that excites me and, and helps me jump out of bed in the morning. And I've been lucky to this point to have that in the clubs I've worked at. And uh, I feel that excitement today. Now I'm, I'm, I'm finally working as a head coach here at QPR. And from then, your early days were kind of in, in the Chelsea Chelsea youth setup, rather. And I absolutely love this quote I found from you, which was, at Chelsea, I felt we had the best players, so we all won. Every coach won. I started asking myself, were we winning or the, were the players winning for us? I think that just kind of shows that the drive you have. But what did you learn from that spell at Chelsea and the kind of elite managers that were at the club at that time? I learned loads because it was a lot of different top managers at the time. Uh, the investment in see the club build from, you know, uh, the link they had here really with Harlington uh, where QPR were training until recently. And that was Chelsea's old base to move into Cobham and seeing the club grow. I worked with some fantastic players and some fantastic staff that have gone on to do well. And some of the managers that come in, it was a real privilege to be inside the club at the time because things drip fed down, which was amazing. Um, I think, uh, you know, the time at Chelsea was, was, was huge. The, the, the statement or the quote that I made, I wouldn't want to be misconstrued. It was, it was a pleasure to work there with the players that we had, but I needed to challenge myself again. So I wasn't necessarily looking for grass that was greener, just one that was maybe cut a little bit differently. And that was certainly the case moving to Liverpool. And that came as a bit of a surprise to your, to your wife, didn't it? Moving to, to Liverpool at that time when you went home that day. Um, working at that club must have been absolutely fantastic. And Jurgen Klopp, did he teach you a, a few things? Firstly, Liverpool is a dream football club to work for. Everything that it stands for, you know, going in there, the history, the people, the city, the culture. I loved every minute. It was everything that I was looking for when I went in. Um, and yeah, I learned loads. You know, Brendan Rodgers was the first head coach that was there. Obviously, familiar face from from the Chelsea as well. And then Jurgen came in, and I learned loads from him. Loads in terms of just the way that he saw football compared to um, uh, to to the club where it was at the time. In terms of the development of young players being a little bit later and not being so judgmental on a player at eighteen, nineteen. That you know, it's much more towards twenty two, twenty three, and and. And, and I thought that was a breath of fresh air, you know, for a foreign coach coming into England saying to us, look, give your young players a little bit more time. I also think that he's gone in with a very clear vision of the way that he wants to work. And uh, he's implemented that over the six, seven years to huge success. So to see that and see the people at Liverpool get that success, it's been fantastic, to be honest. It's, it's a city very close to my heart because I had my middle child there as well. So I've got three children. They're all born in different places. So my wife made the decisions that I've been I've made in my career have not got any easier for her to be honest and I suppose the biggest success story from Liverpool's academy in recent years has been Trent Alexander-Arnold um, I know you watched a fair bit of him and, and saw him go through the ranks was he standing out like a sore thumb or was it one of a, a group of talented players well I see him the very first weekend I started at the club in 2012 he was playing against May United as a centre back in the under 14s Trent was capable of, of magic moments, which are no surprise now because we see it on a regular basis in the Premier League and, and in the Champions League. But back then, this young, wiry young boy was just arms and legs, but he could do something absolutely outrageously good. And then in other moments of erratic behaviour, like you expect kids to have at that age. And I made a sportsman's bet with the education welfare officer at the time that I felt Trent would make the first team. It was just a hunch. He looked different to the other players I was watching that day. 
through the age groups. And he was a person that I was really privileged to work quite closely with um, before he became uh, a professional. And in his family network around him have been hugely supportive of him. Uh, his mum, Diane, she's a, she's a diamond. You know, she's a person that I really like. I remember when I was leaving Liverpool, she comes to the training ground with a big bag full of gifts and stuff for me. So, uh, no, it's, it's a family that I'm, I'm so pleased for them, not just the boy, the whole family. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm really intrigued by your spell in uh, in Brazil with Sao Paulo. I guess that's a leap of faith that you took then, which is perhaps a little bit comparable to the, the one you've taken now with taking your first first team uh, job at QPR. Yeah, I think I'm I'm being quite good at realizing when I need another challenge, when I need to push myself to the next level or or make a big jump and make the next step in my career. And the one to Sao Paulo was a huge one. It was obviously a bit different. You know, I, I remember Jurgen saying he wouldn't do it. Um, but each to their own. I needed it to get to the next stage. I needed it to answer a few questions. I needed to challenge myself with the language, the culture, working at first team level, working with an icon like Rogerio Senni. And I tell you what, it was an amazing experience. I would do it again in the future if the opportunity came because I really enjoyed myself. Brazilian people in a whole are so family orientated and such good people. And I saw things in terms of development of young players at the academy at Sao Paulo and just in South American football in general that the other, the other people in Europe, we don't get to see. So I feel hugely privileged for having that uh, opportunity, which is very rare for an English coach. Exactly. And now we've moved on to your, your spells at uh, Rangers and, and Villa under Steven Gerrard. You've clearly worked with some amazing coaches and managers uh, during your, your career so far. Are there any you would say have been your biggest influences so far? I think, like, I'm a big fan of certain coaches. So I really like Carlo Ancelotti. I wasn't close to him in the time at Chelsea because I was just coaching the U team. I just really liked him. He came and did a CPD with us once and I was blown away by it. And I just like him as a person. I think he goes into clubs and he leaves them in a better place. You know, some managers go into a club and when they leave, there's like chaos going on and, you know, the club's in trauma. But in, with Carlo, he goes in a club and he tends to leave yeah, a better place. And he's managed around the world in different languages and he's just so calm and he, he makes it about the players. And that's what I believe in. I think Jürgen's had a big influence. Steven Gerrard's had a huge influence on me in terms of he's a real quality human being. He's got a lot of real... Um, values as a person that I really respect and it's hard for me to respect someone more than I respect Stephen in terms of a man and the time that we spent together along with Gary McAllister and the rest of the staff was fantastic I feel like Stephen's like a football brother if you like and uh, it's never the right moment for that relationship to end but it was important that I, I make sure that when I started out in football that I had some things that I wanted to achieve it was important that I remembered that and, and I got on to, to starting to do that but at the same time, it had to be the right opportunity. And I think when I spoke to Stephen, he was very appreciative of the fact that I felt this was the right one and he didn't stand in my way. He was actually very, very good with me. Well, you've answered my next question there, which was how was the relationship left with uh, Villa and Gerard? So I'll move on to the next one, which is about kind of Villa's youth prospects and the players they've got there. I mean, Cameron Archer is probably the, the striker of note, which a lot of clubs are going after at the moment, if they could get him on loan. Do you think you'll be able to use these links, not only with Villa, but with Rangers as well, to potentially bring some players in this summer? Yeah, well, I think football's a big ocean and I don't want to just, you know, go and go and uh, look in, you know, one little place. I want to, uh, you know, the QPR, I've got no ties to Aston Villa or the clubs that I've been at previously, Rangers, Liverpool or, or Chelsea. What I would say is that, there's some fantastic players at Aston Villa. It reminds me of my time at Chelsea, the amount of volume of players that could potentially come through, headed by Jacob Ramsey is maybe the standout at this moment in time. But they've got six, seven, eight, possibly nine players coming behind that that will need experience going out on loan or breaking through. They'll need time and patience. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time for, for Aston Villa. It's a really exciting time for us, us at QPR in terms of our recruitment because I'm not limited to one place. And uh, if I'm, if we're proven to be a club where players can develop and kick on or a club that plays a nice style of football over time, then I'm sure that everyone will be willing to give us some players on loan. But the most important thing is that we develop our own. And I, I, if, if I had a preference, I'd rather the player be a QPR player full-time because I feel that 
that invests in in our club being sustainable and being successful over time. So that's my focus right now. One player who is now a QPR player, Jake Clark, also your first signing. He came in on a free transfer from Chelsea. You knew him as a youngster at Chelsea, and he spoke in his uh, signing press conference of this presentation that you gave him. Could you give him some, uh, give us some insight into what that was and how you convinced him to join QPR over the other clubs that were interested? Well, firstly, that's a prime example of what I was speaking about just there, that if you can get, you know, a player of Jake's age who's had that experience, big experience as a youth international and someone that's won everything he could as a youth player and experience in our league as our player, then that would be a fantastic thing for us as a club because we can develop, enhance that and nurture that onwards. In terms of my relationship with Jake, he came in to Chelsea as a really young boy, as a centre forward. I remember playing at Stamford Bridge at the end of the season and he was playing up front with Dominic Solanke and Tammy Abraham. So I've known him since like the under nine, under tens. I coached him at 13, 14 as well. I've watched him from afar. We've not always been in contact, but strangely enough, at the end of the season, we were in contact for the first time in a while. At that moment, there was... There was no inkling that I would I would be leaving Aston Villa. And then I had to quickly phone him when I got announced here because they obviously my advice could change now. I could give him an opportunity. He had a lot of options. And um, so it was more a case of, look, let's sit down and let me go through where I think you're at right now in your career and where I think you can get to. And what let's work backwards. What are the steps in between that we need to fulfill? You need a home. You need a coach that knows you. You need a style of football you need a platform for you to fulfill it fill your potential and and he he believes in that as well and he was very hungry and ang- um hungry and and ambitious to come and work with us here at QPR he played against our team last year and he liked our team so there was a lot of things that came together and aligned and hopefully that gives Jake the best opportunity for him to do well in the future because he deserves it I think he's had like most players that go on loan, he's been on loan for the last four or five years. So he hasn't felt like one place was his home, one changing room. That was the change room that he was in and he could build his leadership skills and, and build his, his relationships in it. So, you know, now this is his home. He can do all that here at QPR and hopefully he can fulfil. But what we'll try and do is remove all the excuses for maybe why a young player won't fulfil their potential. We'll try to, you know, we we'll give them everything we can to allow them that platform to uh, to be successful. And another signing you made, Kenneth Powell, I hope I've said that right. Is it true that you spotted him at a youth tournament at the age of 13 as well? It seems to be a running yeah. thing here, Michael. I'll tell you that the, the tournament was in Kusadazi in Turkey. Uh, Kenneth's mum was here with him the other day and his two sisters when he came to sign. She was also at the tournament. I didn't know that, but we were talking about it. He played for PSV and I played obviously was coaching Chelsea. The tournament was a great tournament. It was 12 European teams, 12 Turkish teams. And on the Saturday before the final on Sunday, which we won, we beat Besiktas on penalties. On the Saturday, they had uh, you had to pick two teams from each squad. And they asked me to be the coach of that team for the European team. So I had to pick some players and I picked Kenneth. He was the left winger at the time. Whenever you go on these tours, when you're a young coach, you go around Europe, I always have to write down the names of the best players. So Kenneth's been on the list, came back, recommended him to Chelsea, tried to sign him for Glasgow Rangers two years ago. Um, and it didn't work out at that moment in time. And so when I heard uh, I was coming in here, when it was a reality and I saw that Kenneth was available, it was one of the first phone calls I made was uh, to, to his agent to ask if he was available. And then, come in here and spoke to the staff here and the club had been tracking him also for two years. So they had a load of scouting reports as well. So it was one of them things that came together. I think Kenneth's the same age as Jake Clark, sort of 24. We have a lot of players in our squad like that. He was at PSV and he's played for the Dutch youth team. This is a big move and a big opportunity for him. His motivation to come play in England, specifically London, was huge. He turned down other offers to come. Um, I think in the case of both boys, maybe stronger offers financially. So it shows that we must be doing something right at QPR, that it's an attractive proposition. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Kenneth can do. Exactly. And and we move on to players that were there last season. Chris Willock, Rob Dickey and Elias share three amazing players at this level. You've said you're excited to manage them. Is that a clear sign they're all staying put at QPR? Do you think in danger of losing any of those key men this summer? No, I've not heard any of that. We're not in a rush to sell anyone. We actually think that these boys have got more to come in terms of raising their their potential um, 
you know, transfer fee if they were to move on in the future. We're very much in, um, count on them being part of a very good team vehicle here that can take QPR towards where them players want to go, which I'm sure is the Premier League. We're all aiming for that. Uh, what's for sure is like with a Barry Eze, if the offer's right and the player has a real opportunity to go there and be a key player in the Premier League, we wouldn't stand in people's way, but the offer has to be right. It has to respect the work that we've done. You're right in them three, but there's more as well. We've got a really, we've got a squad of players that if anything, we lack a little bit of experience. We don't lack potential. But I think after last year's season and disappointment, I'm hoping that the changing room has grown from that experience and it makes them even keener and hungrier to succeed this year. So that's the exciting thing for me. And you've you've coached some amazing players in the past, Edda Middletown, Coutinho, Buendia, of course. Bit of a fantasy question. If you could sign any player who you've coached in the past at youth level or senior level, who would you sign for this QPR team? Oh, that's a really difficult question, that because you know you, you, I'm I'm going to avoid all of my like <laughs> ex football sons, like your Mason Mounts, your Declan Rice's. It wouldn't be fair, Trent Alexander. So I want to talk to you about Phil Coutinho because Coutinho came to Aston Villa in January, and he's the most humble young man I've met, and yet he's achieved so much. So he's a big lesson for everybody in football in terms of whatever you've achieved, the way that you carry yourself day in, day out. I'm massive on humility. I look at players, especially young players, and I wait for the moment where they might change. And, and I'm always on at young players about that, the humility, how you are as a person. You know, with footballers, sometimes they can get carried away with their footballer. No, you're a person that plays football. It's important that you, 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 you remain humble and you show that humility. Phil Coutinho does that. And he's the best player, which is just, it's like the perfect thing. So if there was one player I could bring here to QPR, as much for his football, but also for the way that he carries himself, it would be Phil Coutinho. Because I just think he's just the most uh, fantastic young man who's just so, uh, he's so aware of who he is. He's so shy. Um, but he's so aware about being a good person and he works hard. He's on that training pitch every minute of every day. So sometimes you can bring a player in a football club where the other young players and the young players at Aston Villa will certainly be seeing it. He's like an example to them. And I think he's a shining example for the rest of the players at Aston Villa. And they're in a good shape. They've got a really good coach and staff. They took another one of my football friends in to replace me in Neil Critchley and uh, I'll be supporting them this season from afar for sure and I'd like to just finish with a, a few fan questions I put a tweet out to get some QPR fans to ask you some questions um, first off from up the R's obviously there were several clubs interested in you but what made you pick QPR the squad there's some key players in this squad that excite me and then you couple that with meeting the owners and discussing and, and I felt the energy from them in the room when I met them towards me towards the project and the, the, the third one, I suppose, was the, the the vision. OK, it's OK having this excitement, these players, what are you asking me to do? And I thought they were very sensible in, in their, their outtake on where the club is and what it can potentially do. There was no massive demands, which it, it, there was a lot of key things said that, uh, that made me pick this one over another one. Talking Rangers asks, with the perspective of your individual past experience, knowledge and expertise, why do you think it makes you the right man to take this QPR side to the next level? Well, I think we have a lot of players that have got their best days in front of them. So therefore, the person that leads them or sets up the coaching team that leads them has to really invest in everybody's you versus yourself journey uh, to be the best version of yourself. And that's something that I've got many years experienced in. I'm also... Um, I'm just as up and coming in the coaching world as they are in the football world. So we're underdogs. So we're going to adopt that mentality to, uh, to try and fulfill that. We have that big burning desire and energy. The players have it. So I think the management team have got to be, have got to be feeding into that as well. And, and I f certainly think that fits myself. It's very good. One from Jeremy Walter here is, is pretty well articulated. And from what you've said already to me, that club is trying to sign younger players that they maybe can sell on, that maybe can improve at the club. Would the club consider signing any older experienced players this summer for balance? 
Yeah, of course. I think it's got to be the right player at the right finances. I think, you know, our budget is, is well documented it's towards the bottom end in the, you know, the bottom 20% maybe or 30% in the league. So you have to you have to use your, your finances wisely. We certainly wouldn't discriminate on a player down to age. You know, this, this is this is about having an effective uh, winning QPR team that, you know, it's for the fans, isn't it? It's, you know, the, this football club exists here for the fans. So it's important we listen to what's said outside. As I said last year, experience is, is an interesting thing because do you have to have a bad experience to have experience? Do you have to have been along around, around a long time to have experience? So if I take it in my own case, the clubs that I've worked at, that's a wonderful experience. So I feel that I'm more than ready to fulfil this role. And I would say that about some of the players as well. You know, if you talk about someone like young Chris Willock, who was at Arsenal and he took the risk to go over to Benfica and he's come back and now he's had a year in the championship and done really well. I think that's fantastic experience that you can draw on to push on. So I think it's, we've got to be careful with uh, mixing experience with age. I think it's the experiences each person's had. Uh, do, do I feel that our team could do with a little bit of age? Possibly. Am I looking for 24, 25, 26 year olds to take that mantle on? Certainly. And how many players are you looking to bring in this window? That's a question from Oscar Collins. Is there a figure that you're looking at or does it depend on uh, who goes out the door? No, I think it depends on the quality of the players when we start working and the areas that I feel need improvement. I think when a new manager comes in, everyone starts with a clean slate, but certainly when you start implementing your style, some players benefit from it and some players naturally don't. Or, or you know, it might be one or two players knock on my door and want to move on because they, they have offers elsewhere. So it's never a set number. We've done two already that was very important positions for us to strengthen. We're going to bring one or two back from loan who I think can play a part in the team and I'm looking forward to working with them. And then we'll assess. I think it's fair to say we'll do one or two bits more, uh, but I wouldn't want to put a number on it right now. That's absolutely fine. Joseph Plum asks, what is your realistic and main goal for your first season as a manager? Well, it's to implement the style. It's to implement the style and implement a, a, an environment here because we're transitioning from Harlington to Heston for everyone to be together. For me, it's really important. I create harmony in the club, a pathway for the young players and the young staff, which is just as important to create an environment where everyone feels they can be themselves and then therefore kick on to be the best version of themselves. And then a way of playing football and training that excites people. If you do them things, this club will move forward. Are we guaranteed to go up? No, if you look at the teams that come out of the Premier League with the you know with the parachute payments and the teams that come out last year, let's leave the focus on them and we'll just you know we'll remain very humble but very ambitious inside and just start working. I think if I put the 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 pieces in place behind the scenes and the results on the pitch will be a reflection of that. They will come over time for that. I think last year the team did very well um, and then finished very indifferent. And so what team are we? Um, that's down to the players. They've got to decide which direction they want to go in. So I'm excited to challenge them and provoke them and support them to be the best version of themselves. And then and then I'm sure we'll do OK. And from what you said there, is there any sort of pressure coming from above about kind of expectations this season? No, the biggest pressure would come from myself and, and, and the amount of... Um, expectations you put on yourself and it will come from our dressing room. I can assure you that, you know, our players are super ambitious. They come back to pre-season. I've spoke to most of them with the biggest ambition in the world. But so are the other 23 clubs in the championship. And it's probably the toughest league in the world because the teams are pretty much on an even kill. We'll have to fight, scrap and show quality to get every point we can. And there'll be, there's no big statement going out where, where we are, but we, we're certainly going to look at last year and want to kick upwards from there because that's what every club should do every season. And finally, last question here from the 72, a Rangers-based question. There's a lot of talk about Celtic and Rangers compared to the English side. So where do you think the Rangers team you worked with would finish in the Premier League? They'd finish in the top 10 or around the top 10 in the Premier League. I've been worked with them players and worked in the Premier League and understanding the size of that club and what it would be like for an away team to go and play there. They've just got to Europa League final. So who gets to a Europa League final that can't play football to a good level? They have a number of players that can kick on and do well. And uh, yeah, I think if they were in the Premier League, both clubs, the amount of wealth that would add overnight 
and the amount of players who want to play for him. This is like the biggest debate, and it seems like the most pointless debate because we're never going to get to a situation where it should happen. I think it should have happened before now because I think the Premier League is the world's league. Uh, I don't think it's the English league. And therefore, I, I think there's room, you know, for the Welsh teams can play in it. There's room for the Scottish teams as well. But to not upset people and go round and round the houses, uh, I personally feel, from my opinion, having worked up there, that them two teams would be in the top 10 in the Premier League within no time if they were here because they're huge football clubs with huge histories and as big as the teams that are currently occupying them positions. That's the safest way to answer that, Simon, without upsetting everybody. Played that very well, very straight bat. Thank (laughs) you very much for joining us today, Michael, and I wish you the best of luck for the season.